Okay, here we go. So today we are talking about something that we've kind of touched on a little bit on occasion because people have asked questions about it and like wanted to know more about this, but I've been like, no, wait, we'll talk about it later. And today's the day, folks, we're talking about it later. What is it, might you ask? And the answer is environmental concerns and cultural concerns, like social cultural concerns. Um, oh, Jesus, is that Diego? Mute yourself. Oh my God, you guys are together? Please mute yourselves. You sound horrifying. I'm muting you. Okay, I'm teaching right now. So, um, today we're going to talk about the environmental impacts of things. Sounds like a mogwai. Yeah, that was really awful sounding. It, Diego, your mic is just like really weird. But before we do that, what CIA operation involved sex workers and LSD? Come on, you guys. Sex workers and acid. I'll give you a hint. The name sounds like an innuendo, and it was an offshoot of MK Ultra. Climax something or other. Yeah, climax something or other. Really? Mm -hmm. Operation Midnight Climax. Oh, Ryan, you've been killing it recently. So sorry. <laughs> what part of the internet is predominantly used for the drug black sales? Market. The dark net. <laughs> okay, we have a student in my room right now, which is, do you want to say it louder? Which, is it right? Uh huh. The dark net. The dark net, which is also known as the dark, or the, the deep, deep net, web. which is. So there's the deep web and the dark net, but you can apparently also call it the dark web. However, it's important to note that if it's deep, it's 90 to 96% of the internet. If it's dark, or if it's the net <laughs> below that, it can be uh, either a net or a web. I know that's a little confusing. How long does a drug patent last? 20. 20 years. What is an orphan drug? Less than, what do they say, 20,000 patients? You're really close. Two, You're really close. 200,000 patients. 200, uh, I second guess myself because I was thinking, no, 200,000 is probably a bit much. <laughs> well, considering the population of the U.S., it, it is still tiny, but like I totally, yeah, I understand. Anyone remember what the Manchurian candidate is? Uh-oh, my messenger's open. Manchurian candidate, anyone? Bueller? Let me close this while the time is right. Okay, we'll just skip to it so we get through everything today. Manchurian candidate is a theoretical person that can be basically deprogrammed and reprogrammed by the United States government um, by drugs to do the government's bidding. And this was something that the government was really, really fiending for during the Cold War era because their argument was basically that the Soviets were doing it, so therefore so should we, which is great logic that really got us places. Anyone know what this is? Is everyone asleep? Burner phone. That's a burner phone, thank you. Burner phone is something that can be destroyed after use. It's effectively something that is used for the purpose of um, getting rid of evidence of doing something illegal like ordering or selling drugs or ordering a hit, which you probably shouldn't do over the phone in general if possible. Um, and these were more popular back in like the mid 2000s when encrypted messaging services like Signal and Wicker weren't available, but they are still definitely used. Anyone know what this plant is called? I'll give you a hint. It is a consequence of trying to kill coca crops. I'd be very impressed if anyone remembered this. It's just a different kind that's more adaptable, isn't it? It's super coca. So you're on the right track. Yeah, it's a strain of coca plant that grew to be resistant to pesticides. So they inadvertently created very powerful coca, Boliviana Negra, in response to um, air spraying pesticides. Okay, now a long time ago I talked about the environmental impacts of MDMA. And since making this course, I have not had time to update this, unfortunately. So I'll tell you some verbal supplemental information. This is like folklore of the drug world. This is the kind of stuff that really gets me going. So typically to make MDMA, you need saffron oil. 
which comes from the sassafras tree. And yes, it is the same tree that is used to make root beer. And the process of extracting saffron oil from these trees is very intensive. It requires a lot of processing. It requires destroying the tree in the process too as well, right? Um, now, one of the major sources of, of saffron oil comes from a kind of very endangered region in Cambodia, the Cardamom Rainforest. And in the process of poaching, because these are very endangered um, regions, right? Like these are sensitive habitats. The process of poaching saffron oil from these trees actually led there to be the development of this huge illicit army of people basically that were not only poaching saffron oils, but were also disrupting natural environments and local wildlife as well. So that became kind of a mess, right? You know, um, it led to a lot of issues from a biological level on a, a biome level in many ways. And because of this, there have been military forces deployed in these forests. Um, it's just caused a lot of, of environmental destruction to make MDMA because of this saffron acquisition. Now, in 2010, I think it was, there was an order from the United States government basically being like, hey, Cambodia, you should start destroying all of this saffron oil in as large quantities as possible. Like, get rid of it, get it the hell out of here because it's being used to make molly and oh no, uh -oh. So the Cambodian government was like, oh, yeah, okay, I guess that's a pretty good idea. So they destroyed a metric buttload of saffron oil in 2010. They just fucking destroyed it. And this is the stuff that you need to make molly, right? So without this, how are you gonna make, make your molly? Now the unintended consequence of this is that without any kind of supply of precursor to make molly, remember a precursor is like an ingredient basically, Without this precursor saffron oil, the market just collapsed for real MDMA. So in this mad scramble to find another viable source of saffron oil, because even though this isn't the only one in the world, it was one of the biggest ones, people started using other drugs instead. So for instance, this, uh, this drug called PMA it falls under the category called piperzines. And PMA and PMMA, if any of you are familiar with these drugs, you probably have been at least kind of in harm reduction for a minute because between 2010 and 2014, ecstasy pills were really, really frequently adulterated with PMA and PMMA. And the issue here is that PMA and PMMA um, can have kind of like weird, mild antidepressant effects, but they can also make you violently ill and potentially kill you. So we were seeing this huge spike in people having fatal overdoses on PMA and PMMA between 2010 and 2014. This is problem we don't like. So of course we started like trying to get more test kits out to identify these adulterated PMA pills. But here's the thing about test kits, for those of you that don't know this already. PMA, um, let's see first a show of uh, weird anthropomorphized thumbs. How many of you have used a reagent kit before? One, two, three, only three of you? Oh, that surprises me. Okay, so um, when you use a reagent kit, and we'll come back to how to do this, I'll do a demo and everything. You use this little bottle of sulfuric acid and you have to use several of them, right? Because when you drop one drop of this liquid on a little bit of your drug, it will presumably change color. Now, the issue, is that some drugs have no reaction with a certain reagent. So like the Marquis reagent, it's just the name of this kind of acid, um, will not react with PMA or PMMA. And that's like a, a, an actual response is no reaction. Whereas with MDMA, it will turn black. So the dealers got smart about it and they started doing a 90 to 10 ratio. They would put 90% PMA or PMMA in these pressed pills and 10% actual MDMA. So people would think that they were being very safe by testing their drugs. They would scrape off a bit of their pill and they would test it, it would turn black because while it was predominantly reacting, no reaction with this invisible thing, what is still open? I thought I closed that. Um, they were still seeing that black reaction. So you can see how this could really be dangerous and make people really not trust test kits and not trust their ecstasy. Anyway, that's my biggest side. Now in 2014, here, just kidding, my side isn't over. 2014, we discovered a different precursor called PMK glycidate. And PMK glycidate can be made in a lab, it's mass produced in China and other areas. And it's basically, it's like 
the same, you know, like it produces the same end chemical. There are some people that claim that it's a slightly different experience, but I'd imagine that's more related to the organic and inorganic impurities than the actual end product, which is definitively MDMA. So that's the story of how 2010 to 2014 created this market for like highly deadly adulterated molly that couldn't be easily identified via a test kit because no reaction blends in with other like minute quantities of drugs. It's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. Now we have to go really fast because I just spent too much time on that. <laughs> but it's, I hope it's interesting, okay? This is like the trivia that you can't find on the internet easily. This is like the, the hidden sneaky stuff. So this environmental issue with Cambodia is one thing, but it extends to most other drug markets. Like the process of manufacturing and making drugs is environmentally damaging, largely if not entirely in part of the lack of regulation surrounding it, which makes sense, right? So for instance, when we're looking at cocaine, there are methods that are required in order to plant coca crops. You need large swaths of land, and this predominantly happens in South America, and two techniques are used called slash and burn and clear cutting. And both of these basically mean destroy what's on the land, clear it from new crops, plant the new crops. And this has led to 15 to 30 percent, approximately, of the annual deforestation in Guatemala and Nicaragua. Like, this is a major cause of deforestation. And initially, you might, like, think, okay, you know, it's it's probably not that big of a deal. It's just, like, it's just one facet of global warming and climate change. Yes, that's true. But the issue is that through time, what happens is we send in people to get rid of the coca crops, destroy them with pesticides or whatever else. We'll come back to that. Then after those crops have been destroyed, the farmers are like, huh, well, I mean, this is how we, I don't know, stay alive. So they start pushing back and back. They start removing themselves more and more from the traditional areas that they would farm in. And this pushes them into endangered territories where they, again, slash and burn and clear cut. They clear massive amounts of space in rainforest areas. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the rainforests in South America account for the majority of the oxygen production in the world. Unless I'm getting that fact fucked up, but I really don't think I am. So this is actually like life-threatening for the entire planet when you think about it, because these are the most critical sources of oxygen. Like this is the thing that has been preventing climate change from toppling is having these forests. And this isn't just like child's play. This isn't just you cut down an area. This is like the rainforest is getting destroyed because coca farmers are being forced to push back into these untouched natural areas. Now, this has also been caused by displacement in Colombia. Um, people have to like leave and move around a lot, which is obviously a problem. It means that people have to, most oxygen comes from algae, but terrestrially, yes, rainforest produce the most oxygen. That, yeah, okay, that's, that's what I was thinking, but thank you for clarifying it. And yeah, me, not biologist, but should know that fact off the top of my head. I knew it was oxygen related. So many things can cause displacement, right? Um, Enviro nerd over here, great, then this hopefully is right up your alley. So we've seen a lot of habitat destruction, but it's not just this, it gets even worse. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> it's like a real 2020 slideshow here. Now, the process of harvesting coca crops and harvesting crops in general has been passed down through millennia in South America. Like it's a specific pattern, it requires a certain kind of hillside. The reason for this is that harvesting crops causes soil erosion. It causes the, the dirt and the ground to break down and become less stable. Now, in response to this, there can be mudslides and landslides, which again, if you're someone that hasn't experienced one of these, you might be like, well, that's not that big of a deal. It's like the most minor natural disaster. But entire towns can be eradicated by mudslides and landslides. This is the town of Makoa in Colombia. In 2014, it was almost entirely destroyed by mud, mudslides. Now, this is something that has been known about because before people were being forced into these regions that were not previously supposed to support coca crops, this wasn't a thing that happened because this is knowledge that's been passed down through generations from farmers that were already aware of this tendency for these crops to erode the soil. And because of this, we see like money laundering operations and, and illegal cattle ranchers and coca farmers, like all of these markets that have been pushed under the radar because of poverty are causing landslides and mudslides and it's dangerous. 
In the meantime, if we're making something like cocaine, this is a little sample of like part of the process of making it. And like, no, that's not what you get in your baggie. And if it is, you say what the fuck to your dealer or hopefully don't buy it in the first place because that'd be a severe lack of judgment. It looks like a crumbly cluster of cocoa crispies or whatever those things are called, this breakfast cereal, but like held together by gum or like mud or whatever. So in order to make cocaine, or coca paste specifically, which is made into cocaine. You need kerosene, an acetone, and toluene, sulfuric acid, acetic acid, ammonia, carbide, calcium carbonate. These are all toxic chemicals. And a lot of the time, when the government finds a lab that's making coca, it orders that these waste materials are dumped into waterways to get rid of them so they can't be used. Or they're synthesis materials. And there's also waste materials, right? Like, there's both. It's two kinds of muck. It's like the Lorax. In 2015, 81,000 tons of toxic waste was dumped into waterways because of coca cultivation, illicit coca cultivation specifically. Because if you're trying to destroy the evidence of your, your lab site, then you have to get rid of it in the most effective way. But we're seeing this pollute waterways and like kill entire species because of this. It's a ripple effect that is infecting the entire climate of the entire planet. Now, last time I mentioned that the pesticides that are being sprayed over coca crops are made by Monsanto. It's Roundup, right? Um, and there's a lot of controversy over whether or not this is dangerous. However, um, we're currently looking into whether or not this has carcinogenic effects on the people that are impacted. Um, one of the major problems here is that spraying a mist from like hundreds of feet above the ground out of an airplane is pretty fucking inexact. So if you're trying to spray over these crops, you can see over here that this is, like the green is where the actual coca cultivation is. Like this is where the actual crops are. And these yellow areas are in 2012 where they were actually spraying. <laughs> so not only is a lot of this getting missed entirely and they're just kind of like spraying random areas, but also there is drift over the border into Ecuador, who specifically was like, don't do this, please. And this drift of these pesticides is leading to health problems because a lot of the people that are impacted that are like playing in the fields while this is happening, like there are children that play in the fields, in coca fields, just because they live there. It's like their home, it's part of their home. So this ingredient, um, glyphosate, has been declared probably carcinogenic to humans. There's not really hard evidence scientifically yet that I'm aware of that supports it fully as being carcinogenic. Let's be honest, I think it's pretty likely though. But this is just also an issue because it, it mists onto like people playing in the fields, as I said before, but also other crops that get destroyed in the process. Um, there is some evidence showing that respiratory and skin health are impacted, which totally makes sense, I think, as well. Now, looking at meth, I mentioned in the past that doing shake and bake, where you put the ingredients in a thing and you shake shit up, and if you don't let off enough steam, it explodes and burns you, is true. You can get skin graft situations like this. But also, this is like a recipe for explosions, and the toxic byproducts of meth are toxic byproducts that are once again dumped into waterways. Waterways are where all of the shit ends up afterwards. Um, and if they're not directly dumped into waterways, then if you dump it into the soil, then groundwater is contaminated and then waterways become contaminated. Like it, it ends up in the water no matter what. For every one pound of meth that's produced, five to seven pounds of toxic waste byproducts are produced. That's a, a five to seven to one ratio. That's a very, very large ratio. In addition to this, the fumes of production can be absorbed into porous materials around the house like couches and walls and people. Like everyone is impacted by meth production in this way. And just cleaning up meth labs is very costly because you have to dispose of all of these ingredients with such care. Is MDMA still produced from sassafras trees or is it mostly synthetic now? I was thinking about this a, a little bit ago. To my knowledge, it's now become fairly even because what happened in 2010 was that a huge stash of saffron oil was destroyed. Like it was 
enough for millions of pills of ecstasy. So it took a while for that stash of saffron oil to build up again after that one huge disruption. So, and it's true that sassafras trees do grow in some regions, I think of the Northeastern United States, correct me if I'm wrong on that, and also do grow in other areas in the world. So I think that it's become more even through time, like it's more of a 60-40, 50-50, et cetera. Um, Some people claim like, oh, this is like sassafras derived MDMA. Unless they literally know the people that harvested the saffron oil, they probably have no idea, Or, or they're the chemist, you know. So here's another one that we've talked about in the past. Um, Peyote is something we'll be talking about today in more detail than we ever have, which is super cool because peyote's history is really complicated. Um, It is considered to be vulnerable now as a plant because all of the millennial pseudo hippies have been going ham on trying to get their hands on some peyote in its indigenous environments. To grow a single mature button of peyote, it takes about 10 years. That's a long time, especially because you need to consume, I think around like 10 to 20 buttons to trip. So the problem is that people that don't understand not only how sensitive this plant is, but also how long it takes to grow and the specifics of its maturation, will just pull it up by the root, which destroys the plant's ability to, pr- to recreate, right? Um, in addition to this, in southern Texas, farmers will often use plows to plow up peyote buttons, or feral hogs will eat them, or housing disturbance will, uh, housing developments will destroy them. Um, there are people named that are referred to as peyoteros, which harvest the young buttons, which is also an issue because it means that they don't have time to mature and spread seeds as far and wide as they would have otherwise, which just further reduces access. Um, When I first heard of sassafras, I was told it was a mixture of ecstasy and acid. Goes to show how much 18-year-old college kids really know. Actually, there's more to be said here. So um, sassafras is a type of tree, but it's also the full name for MDA. So what you were being told about wasn't like sassafras, the tree itself, but rather sass or MDA, which is kind of like, it's a a different synthesis born of saffron oil. I I don't remember exactly how it's produced, but it's it's a similar process. I think maybe it just like has like either diverging steps near the end or uses slightly different ingredients. But MDA slash sassafras is just a different drug than molly, and it's often described as being a more psychedelic, more physical, more personal MDMA experience. Many people actually directly seek out sass or sassafras. So it is true, you're welcome. So it is true that sass is often described as being like a more acidic molly. It's not nearly as popular or common I do know that in the last year and a half or so, these small round white pills with lightning bolts on them or just like with nothing on them, just like perfectly round white pills were known as white lightning or lightning bolts. And those were like actual MDA that were going around for a while. It's been spiking in in popularity again, surprisingly, because it really fell out for a minute. But yeah. Um, Now looking at weed, because every drug has their demons in this category, We've only recently started going balls to the wall with legalization and decrim, but again, part of the issue is that we're not doing it in such a way that we're addressing all of the things that can really go wrong beforehand. So for instance, the lack of equity in the market, the lack of like attention paid to incarcerated individuals who have been jailed or incarcerated because of cannabis-related crimes. And we also haven't looked at pesticides. So now we have all these new growers that are growing weed all over the country, but the EPA hasn't actually approved any good pesticides for weed, which means that all kinds of stuff is being used on it, which means that we get bugs that are pesticided, and then rodents that are pesticided, and then predators that are pesticided, and then all the way up to bobcats who are experiencing these very slow and very painful deaths from pesticides like proxy poisoning just being passed down and endangered species like spotted owls that are like dying from scabies. Dutch is here, this white lightnings were the best pills ever. (laughs) Um, Now looking into water, and this one is, you know, I'll explain why you probably shouldn't take this one at full face value actually. 
Um, weed plants take approximately six to eight gallons per plant per day. Now there's, there's conflicting evidence on this, so it could be a lot lower than that. It could be like two to five gallons per plant per day. Um, but this is a problem when you consider that most of weed is grown in California, which has like a chronic drought problem. Like California is like the driest fucking desert, like zero lube in that state. And I'm from there, so I can say that. There is a solution for this, which is that if you grow weed indoors instead of outdoors, then you can use condensation as runoff. And that's very valuable because then you can basically recycle the water that the plants are exhaling and feed it to themselves in some weird kind of moderately incestuous cycle. Um, now, the thing is, when we're doing government reports on, on water use, we're not really taking indoor growing into account, or we weren't at the time of this, which is 2018, I believe. So it is possible that water use is a lot lower than this, but it's just something to think about. It's just another piece from this. California sinks a centimeter a year due to farmers taking up so much groundwater. Oh, my poor planet. Um, in addition to this, when we're looking at uh, carbon emissions from growing weed, Indoor growing produces about 3 million cars and 2 million homes worth of carbon dioxide emissions in a year, which is because there's so much technology required to run an indoor grow lab. So there are ways around this, obviously, using more environmentally friendly things, but it takes, um, to, to make one joint, it takes about as much power as it would to keep a 100 watt light bulb going for an entire day. So this is something to take into consideration. It doesn't necessarily have to like massively impact your views on drugs because Ultimately, like this is a corporate issue always. Like we the lay person is not responsible to the same extent by any stretch of the imagination as like corporations and entities that like abuse their ability to be responsible with their production. So just want to put that out there. And now we take a look at cultural appropriation. And this is one that gets complicated really quickly. I'll give you a brief pre-synopsis, which is that my sentiment here is if you are in doubt, don't do it. Just do something else. There are like literally an infinite number of things that you can do to express yourself and to like delve into shit. If you're even the slightest bit concerned that it could be cultural appropriation, do something different. It's really not that fucking hard. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this, at least in concepts, but just to be positive that we're all on the same page, cultural appropriation is basically a majority or power holding culture that adopts and profits off of in some way, even if it's socially profiting off of the cultural practices or elements of minority culture. And as a white girl, you know, defer to that culture. <laughs> Whatever they're saying, take it at face value. Don't listen to me first and foremost, listen to them first and foremost. And if you're not sure, Google it and there will be opinions. And even if they're conflicting, go to the lowest common denominator of the people that are the most pissed off and listen to them. Not that hard. It's, this is mind boggling to me. So the problem with cultural appropriation, for those of you that have not done a lot of thinking about this, um, is that this practice often dilutes the significance of cultural meaning. Um, for that original culture, and it also tends to be something that um, just like further perpetuates this notion that if you're in a majority demographic and you want something, you can just have it because you want it on principle, but if the roles were reversed, it would not be that way. It would not fly in that same way. It's a reflection of entitlement. Can you make the argument that Dylan Francis is using cultural appropriation by becoming famous for making music rooted in Latin culture. I don't know if I'm the authority to speak on that one. As a Mexican here, I don't see it. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Don't see it as in like, don't see the problem with cultural appropriation? Oh yeah, sorry, um, let me unmute myself. I don't really see it as a cultural appropriation. To me, it's more of an appreciation of the Latin culture. I mean, I get down to Dylan Francis and Diplo because- um, Oh, oh you, know, you meant in terms of Dylan Francis and Diplo, not generally cultural appropriation. Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. Sorry, I should have explained myself a little better about that. No, you're good, you're good. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh, well, I just don't see it as cultural, cultural appropriation because um, I think it's more of an appreciation of like the music itself. 
and you know to stem off you know his style of electronic music to that that's just my personal view on that i think that like i i like hearing you know like you know that mixed into sets all in all it's still kind of like house music though Mm -hmm. cool that's a great perspective thank you so much for sharing i mean a certain amount of cultural transmission is natural and inevitable there's a line somewhere between that kind of transmission or appreciation and straight of appropriation yeah and that's what we're trying to talk about here today which hopefully i won't run out of time to because this is very important because a huge topic right now in drugs in legalization versus decriminalization is this question of white people accessing traditionally non-white or indigenous like ceremonies and rituals and plants and knowledge basically like this concept of the privilege of knowing the right to know things and i'm not going to get super far into this now because a i'm a white girl and it's not my place to to a large extent b we don't have time to and c it's a way bigger issue than what we're talking about here but i just want to touch on some things just like this is information that i have pulled from my peers in harm reduction from by poc leaders um, from directly impacted communities and from doing a lot of work and and like interviewing people that have held perspectives that have belonged to these communities in the past. So again, as always, with anything that I say about this from my demographic standpoint, um, I'm always open to criticism, always open to, to uh, dissent. And if anyone feels uncomfortable with anything that I say here, then please feel free to let me know and I'm more than happy to amend it. But also I really encourage everyone who does not fall into these demographics to do some real thinking about this. The next time you choose what drug you want to do next or know someone who is. Sometimes a funny line, fuzzy line, yeah. So one of the main things that we'll talk about here is this concept of shamanism. And this is just like a term that has been deemed as being very westernized and reductive. It generally is just associated with something that is indigenous and spiritual or medicinal. And this is kind of a globally applied term by westerners to mean like some kind of mystical other spiritual medicinal practice etc so as a broad term a shaman is considered to be someone who in an altered state of consciousness um, contacts the spirit world for themselves or others and this is like contextual based on context or <laughs> contextual based on culture and geographic location it doesn't always have to be through drugs it can be through hypnosis or just like any kind of altered state of consciousness and to become a shaman requires some kind of a rite of passage, some kind of thing that shifts you from one plane or experience level to another. Whenever someone in our culture calls themselves a shaman, I immediately think of them as a poser. Yes, <laughs> same. Uh, one time I was at a rave in Illinois in the middle of nowhere, like a really, really crusty little happy hardcore rave, just like in the boonies. And there was this person this like white person who was like white person with dreads who was like wandering around in rave clothes going i'm a shaman does anyone need healing and i wanted to die <laughs> i wanted to die yeah it was so it was so crusty it was like you're kidding right and i think they had like a feather in their hair and i was like oh anyway so communion with the shamanism or with the spirit world is often something that is considered to be a major facet of it um, this is basically communicating with like forces or entities or deities that are either malevol male malevolent or benign or beneficial. Um, and in some situations, like a witch is considered to be someone that uses this ability to commune for nefarious purposes. Um, in many cultures, anyone can be what is traditionally considered to be or what is, you know, a westernized definition of a shaman. Um, if you learn, basically, if you learn or are chosen or are moved in some way, shape, or form. So this can be used in the form of um, healing or communion or um, imbibing life in things, regardless of what they are, storytelling, guiding other people. But it should be made very clear that the word shaman is not often self-employed in many of these cultures. It is something that is used as a means of attempting to understand something that is far out of the grasp of many Westerners. Now, uh, one example of this is the New Age movement, 
And this was, oh, here's another example of me using the word spurned wrong. <laughs> was shark that pointed this out. I don't know how I got away with this for so long. Spurred, spurred, incited, whatever. Uh, this was not spurned by 60s counterculture. And it's this ideology that revolves around universal consciousness and astrology and crystal healing and um, holistic things and meditation and incense, the rainbow gathering. A lot of things that most people that don't have any exposure to the like actual origins of these practices might consider to be really woo-woo. And those who actually do have exposure to the origins of these practices are frequently pretty irritated with how they have been imposed by Westerners. They just look like wooks. Hashtag wooks. Whitewashed spirituality. I agree with all of the things that were just said. Yes, wooks frequently are new age. So um, this group of people, or the new age group, which started after 60s counterculture, basically was like, we think that private property is moot because we're a collective consciousness, which meant that if a minority community was like, can you not do that thing? That's like our thing that we've been doing forever. And we've had like everything stripped away from us that has made our identity unique. And like, can you just maybe do something else? Like literally anything else. And the new age movement would be like, but like, we're all one, bro, even though you guys like can't vote or whatever. So that was, yeah, that was a problem. And this was a group that was primarily comprised of upper class or upper middle class white Americans. That was this group. What is the SES? Socioeconomic status. Ah, uh, okay. Wealth level, yeah. So, um, San Pedro and Ayahuasca have been like a particular interest, interest to this group. Um, Native American elders have openly denounced New Age for doing this. Um, since we're talking mainly about drugs, we're going to just talk about the drugs part of New Age things. But this gave rise to this concept of neo-shamanism. And we'll come back to all these things in just a second. So there was this guy, Michael Harner who had zero connection to like any cultures that employed what was traditionally referred to as or Western referred to as neo-shamanism or, or shamanism. And he was just like, why don't I write a book about it? <laughs> and like do my own thing. So Michael Harner invented this concept called core shamanism, which is basically just like reducing it into this very simple term. Um, it was very inaccurate. It was super new age. And neo-shamanism is this very like soft kind of doughy flaccid practice that I hope that I'm not slamming this too hard. I'm, I'm supposed to be pretty unbiased, but like it's the end of the course. Like it's, I, it's just coming out, you guys. So neo-shamanism does not make use of like fear and pain and like taking advantage of negative emotions like traditional shamanic practices might. So it's, it's basically very fluffy, you know, this is like a very white version of shamanism. So it, within this, there are plastic shamans who are people that basically claim that they're actually a shaman and they're, they're doing, they're softies, yes. They claim that they're doing like traditionally spiritual things or traditionally um, indigenous things, whatever shamanic practices, but they often just like make shit up and do what they want to. There have been people that have died because of this, because of people that have, for instance, opened like Native American sweat lodges, but not built them correctly, and people have overheated and not been able to get out and died. Um, frequently, indigenous populations are like, what the hell? This is ridiculous, which it is. And the people that practice these have like no connection to the culture that they claim to be a part of. Um, so things like this end up happening. Great spirit. I honor you on the waking days of my life. O oh, great wise ones who guide us on our sacred journey, you know when to reveal the mysteries of truth. Look at this mound of crystals. Just like the clouds part and allow us to see the snow-capped mountains that were obscured from view. So basically people that are just like, I would like to be indigenous, please. One indigenous please. And then they just like do, they just like do what they think is correct. If people cite indigenous origins for their practices, but can't name a specific tribe, then beware. And sequin curtains. <laughs> yes, exactly. Especially because 
even like me using the word indigenous right now is really not appropriate. There are like hundreds of tribes specifically with Native American populations that live across the United States and are thriving and have fully developed very unique cultural backgrounds and they are lumped together in being just native, just indigenous. But like the world is completely comprised of people whose identities and land and behaviors and properties have been stolen directly out from underneath them. And I encourage all of you after this to go ahead and take a look at, if you're in the United States, which I think all of you are, go ahead and take a look at whose occupied territory you're currently living on and get to know which indigenous populations uh, you're basically parked on. Now, looking at mushrooms, this whole deal with the U.S. being really infatuated with mushrooms started after um, a trip to Oaxaca, Mexico, which was where Maria Sabina lived, and she was what was known as a curandera, which is a kind of spiritual helper. So there were two different designations um, in, in South America. There's a curandera. In the case of ayahuasca, there can be an ayahuasquera or an ayahuasquero. And there are people, like a curandera specifically, if I remember correctly, is someone who they themselves take the medicine and go in to try and figure out what's wrong with you and commune with whatever is happening with you. And ayahuasquero, ayahuasquera might go in or like might be with you as you go in or go in alongside you. So there was this one guy, R. Gordon Wasson, in 1957, I believe he went to Oaxaca, Mexico and met Maria Sabina. And he wrote an article in Life Magazine about the, his like discovery of mushrooms that cause strained visions and, you know, on page 13, teenage allowances. And when people found out about Maria Sabina and the mushrooms, um, it became this tourist hotspot. The Beatles went to visit her, and she ultimately said that she regretted letting the Western world into this sphere of, of mushroominess. Because ultimately, she was criminalized. Like, she was hated for how many people, like, flocked to the town. Like, the, the power of the mushrooms, she said, was all but destroyed by all of these people coming in and just using them for their non-intended purposes. Now, meantime, in the meantime, we have um, the doors of perception that really opened the beatniks up to this, this existence of mescaline in 1954 by Aldous Huxley, who's the guy who was injected with LSD as he died. And then there was Carlos Cast Castanedas, um, who was a new age author that talked about peyote in 1968. And then of course there's like, just all of these different introductions of these like mysterious spiritual exotic drugs that were just plants that have been used elsewhere for a long time immediately had this like huge impactful ripple effect in counterculture communities people that were like i want my life to be better and different and mysterious and i would like to be one indigenous please so they started ordering up all of these different plants and immediately these indigenous populations were put in a position of needing to profit off of their culture and their plants and their history or have it taken. That was the decision that had to be made. And in some cases it was perfectly willingly given, but the consequences ended up being very severe, right? Um, people whose entire spirituality and way of life was threatened. We'll come back to that, I think. Oh yeah, right now. So one such example of this is peyote. And the culture of peyote, the history of peyote is very complicated. Um, but the Huichol peoples in northern Mexico are the only group that are legally allowed to use peyote in Mexico. These, these people live completely off the grid. They do not come into contact with um, modernized society and, for the most part. And they have been using peyote as a means of communicating with their deity for generations, like many, 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 many generations. But because of all of the peyote tourism happening in neighboring towns, their supply of peyote is dwindling at an alarming rate, which means that they are getting cut off from their entire spiritual identity as a culture. And their spiritual identity is like a huge component of their cultural identity. Like they have said, if our access to peyote dies, our access to our culture dies. And there's just no protections. In fact, they're currently having to fight against transcontinental mining companies that might go in and destroy their, basically their churches, which is peyote, you know? Um, peyote is also found in, in Southern Texas as well as Northern Mexico. 
but they also are having to use peyote to pay for assistance with cartels and the destruction of their land. Like they are having to sell this part of themselves. And then there's, there's the United States, right, with peyote, which is the, the Native American church is possibly the most famous example of this, which is where native populations who hadn't previously used peyote under like super widespread contexts during like extraordinary whitewashing periods, I think in the late 1800s, they basically were like, we're going to apply for protection so that we can continue using peyote how we see fit. And this founded the Native American church and white people have since been trying to use that as a like, I'm part of the Native American church so I can do peyote kind of deal, which totally dilutes it and is a very big problem. Um, but this basically was like them saying, no, 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 we're going to protect it, protect this as a religion. Like you can't take this away from us as well. Now, ayahuasca is, I would say, one of the biggest controversies here. A lot of people have different opinions on this, and I'll share the opinions that I have collected. Take them with a grain of salt. Listen to the source, okay? So an ayahuasquero, as I mentioned prior, is someone that can brew ayahuasca and conduct a ceremony. They're a facilitator. They aren't necessarily a healer. They are a guide. Um, whereas a curandero or a curandera is someone who is a healer explicitly who goes through training. Um, one of these trainings is a dieta, which is basically spending months or years completely removing strong sensory stimuli so that you can become more attuned to your environment. So no spicy foods, no sex, no like really strong flavors in general. Um, and this is supposedly makes people much more able to like pick up on stimuli. And I have I'm very curious about the neuroscience behind it. I really wonder what happens. Now, in the meantime, there have been plenty of unregulated ceremonies with neo-shaman who have like sexually assaulted people in ayahuasca retreats, who have like even murdered people in the past. People have gone missing. No rave. <laughs> right. Now, the big question here has often been, Originally, the clients didn't even take the brew, just the curandero. Exactly, right. Um, now, here's the big question is, should white people be able to fly out to Brazil or Peru or wherever and pay very expensive fees for an ayahuasca retreat? Is this ethical? Or should white people be able to like buy the ingredients to brew their own ayahuasca at home on the internet or wherever? and just like do it as a DIY ceremony. Like how does this fit into the puzzle? And what I've found when asking people about this, who either are part of or adjacent to these communities, is that generally speaking, the main concern is that people are doing it wrong and causing harm and diluting the value and the power of the substance, that they are not respecting the origins of the substance. And I'll talk about what the actual origins of it are in a second. You might get an understanding for why this is so complicated. So um, oftentimes it's either, like I've said before, either the shaman drinks and tries to identify an illness and a cure, or everyone drinks in a guided setting and there's a purge, etc. cetera. Um, now here's the counter argument to this, which I'll discuss why this is probably not very, you know, effective. In the late 1800s, there was a rubber boom, which is where Europeans basically discovered that there were rubber trees in the Amazon forests, and they wanted to exploit this, which meant that they enslaved the local peoples, which is what white people do, generally speaking. So in response to this, indigenous populations in the Amazon basin would conduct ayahuasca ceremonies in, in secret at night. They would actually row up river to neighboring villages and it was viewed as like a medicinal exchange. It wasn't viewed necessarily as a spiritual practice per se, as opposed to a medicinal thing as though sending a doctor, like it was sending a curandero or a curandera between villages, between areas to do so. So it, it was monetized, you know, like this was a practice that was like viewed as an exchange of goods. It wasn't necessarily like a, an identifying cultural thing, but also inherently the fact that this was happening at all, the fact that this was something that had to be done in secret by enslaved indigenous populations means that it is by nature a cultural exchange, by nature a cultural and very, very 
sensitive thing. Because if you look at this, right, you're looking at the fact that the very people who developed this cultural identity, this medicinal relationship with these plants, had to do so in secret while enslaved. And yet now we have the very same people who enslaved them paying thousands of dollars to fly out and spend nights in fancy retreats to do this thing that had to be done as this like very secretive practice. Doesn't that feel grimy? You know what I mean? It's very complicated. It is very complicated. White people tend to do these ceremonies without having any kind of apprenticeship with people that know what they're doing. Um, novices tend to kind of like fuck things up on their own. People have had really frightening experiences. There is a kind of thought that perhaps the power of these substances will go down through time if they continue to be diluted and exploited. And also pseudo-shamanism has really damaged the industry, right? It is about class privilege, but it's also the kind of thing where Many shamans are in favor of spreading the practice elsewhere in a sustainable and responsible way, like apprenticed healing, because of this concept that like the world could be a better place if it is done so. So what I have gathered from the conversations that I've had and the information that I've gleaned is that generally the sentiment tends to be people can do ayahuasca regardless of background, but you have a fucking responsibility to know where it came from, to respect the shit out of it, to not take yourself too seriously, and ideally to find a way to get trained and give back to the communities involved. In fact, the issue here is that, once again, ayahuasca has become a way for impoverished populations to make enough money to survive. So people that run Amazon retreats for ayahuasca are frequently doing so as a means of just making enough money to get by, and even after all is said and done, they're not taking that much profit home. So if you decide that you want to go to ayahuasca retreat in South America, then you have a responsibility to take care of the surrounding areas, to take care of the impoverished populations that rely on this practice now to get by, to like give back to whatever environment that you're in, and also to do a lot of research. Now this brings us to Ibogaine, which actually, how many of you guys have heard of Ibogaine before? I'm very curious about this. I think you brought it up once, but I don't remember much about it. Yeah. Okay. Never, never heard of it. Nope. Okay, cool. New drug for most of you. I do see that thumb. So Ibogaine is um, found in the Tabernanthe Boga tree of Central Africa. So Iboga is the plant itself. Ibogaine is the actual chemical that's extracted from it. Now, the, the neurological effects of ibogaine are very complicated. It's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, opioid receptor agonist, might also act on glutamate. Can anyone remember another psychedelic that acts on opioid receptors? Another opioid receptor antagonist in that case. I'll give you a hint. Is it ketamine? It's not ketamine, although Ketamine also acts like a little bit on, on opioid receptors. It's an opioid agonist. I thought that someone was going to say that, so I'm glad you did. But no, I'm thinking of something that is also native to Oaxaca, Mexico. A plant. Smoked. Mescaline? You're close. You're so close. You're so close. Salvia? It's salvia. It's salvia. Cactus, <laughs> they say in the chat. Cactus. <laughs> I love it. I love that. I'm laughing not because I think it's a stupid answer, but because I had fun reading it. So, yes, yeah, salvia is another psychedelic that acts on opioid receptors, right? And salvia is notorious for being deeply unpleasant as a psychedelic. However, I was just told by someone last week about their experience doing salvia and turning into a circus tent for three million years. So anything goes on salvia, and it is one of the weirdest and possibly most ultimately like insightful and rewarding drugs in existence, according to many people that I know that are diehards for salvia. Anyway, so Ibogaine, uh, typically low doses are like stimulants, but high doses are very, very powerful psychedelic experiences. In fact, as far as I'm aware, Ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT are the two most powerful psychedelic substances in the world. Um, Ibogaine in particular is a central pillar of the Bwiti religion in Gabon and Cameroon and it's used in what are called initiation ceremonies. 
So this is, remember, it's kind of similar to how DMT is extracted from DMT containing plants. Ibogaine is extracted from iboga. So and it's kind of similar to how ayahuasca contains DMT. So a lot of people will just like take iboga, but it's, yeah. So there's a difference between ibogaine and iboga because um, in Western medicine, Ibogaine is being popularized as an addiction treatment, especially in South America. You can go to a clinic for addiction treatment with extraordinary success, except that, you know, it can actually like kill you if you're not administering it properly because of cardiovascular effects. So it's really important to do Ibogaine with people that know what they're fucking doing. This is actually also mentioned in Princess Bride. <laughs> and then it, uh, Iboga is like the actual plant that's utilized in ceremony. Now, as with all drug use, there are people that are trying to uh, destroy the cultural significance of them. My roommate is like yodeling in the kitchen right now. I don't know if you guys can hear it. It's so distracting. So Christian missionaries go around in Africa and try to shut this shit down. They're like, this is Satanism. And everyone's like, woo, we're actually probably doing better than you are. So of course, there's a tourism industry. So we have the classic elements of a natively ingested, indigenously growing plant that happens to be psychedelic, which is, it's like a, a classic formulaic storyline of there's the plant, there's the people whose culture revol revolves around it, there's the missionaries or the religious figures or the moral elitists who are coming in trying to destroy it, and then there are the people that hear about it and pay great sums of money from foreign lands and come overseas to seek its glory. I just want to take this moment on a completely unrelated note to talk about how cool salt is. You know, in, in high school history, I was always like, salt worth more than gold? No, but now I'm an adult that buys olive oil and spices and salt. It's just amazing. Anyway, so these tourism booms have led to two week long processes of just, or ceremonies, I begin initiation ceremonies, um, where you go through a two week long process of foraging and confessions where you find all the ingredients to make your own brew basically. And then there's a group ceremony. Um, however, people often aren't aware of the fact that Iboga can actually cause really serious heart problems that can kill you. So people in the U S that have tried to DIY it have run into really bad consequences. So basically there, there has been a request that was like, if you really want to do this, then come to the source and respect the source. Now, the question is whether or not we're going to see the same thing that happened with ayahuasca. And this gets even chewier when we look at the fact that we have Ibogaine clinics in South America. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to Ibogaine for addiction treatment because we're going to talk about that next Thursday, I think. But Gabon does not get any kind of compensation for this plant that's being harvested there. You know, like these are countries that are not nearly as wealthy as the United States. And there's just too much demand for these plants for addiction treatments for Westerners who have created their own opioid crisis. So here's the US over here eating glue. And then here's Africa that has this like wealth of natural resources for Ibogaine and Iboga, but small communities that have been historically demonized for using them. And we're coming over and being like, take our religion, but also can we have your plants and we're not gonna give you any money. And if you say no, it'll be a problem. So this feels kind of eerily familiar, right? Like it's the same exact thing happening over and over again in every region of the world. John Stewart does a series on Gambon. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Okay, I'll check it out. Now, here's some big question. Oh no, I'm out of time. Oh, how much more is left here? Oh, bummer. Okay, well, this was the part where I did my like impactful rant for the night, but I'll cut off early and we'll do it next time. Next Tuesday, it is trip sitting, which is my favorite class of the semester. You've made it. Congratulations. You don't have to sit through anything else before trip sitting is happening. So if you made it this far, then mazel tov. I'm so proud of you guys for still coming to class. I know it's continuing for a long ass time. I will see you on Tuesday. Have an absolutely enchanted evening. Setting off.